Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the show, my guest is Andrew Esposito. Andrew is a practicing labor law and HR attorney with Clemens Nelson and Associates out of Ohio and joins us on the show to talk about all things legal risk in the workplace. This is not a topic that we've covered on the podcast in the past, but since the the subject of the podcast is the intersection between business operations and personal finance, I thought this would be a great one to have a subject matter expert come in and enlighten us all on. We had a really good conversation. Andrew talks uh, about a lot of the basic and more complex issues that business owners face, including the biggest legal risk to employers. Coincidentally, we stopped the recording at the end of the interview, and then he shared with me a couple anecdotes about the two of the crazier stories that have come across his desk in his practice. And I thought I would share them with you all here, a brief summary at least, because I found them quite amusing. The first was that he once had a client who had two employees actually fake their own kidnappings to get out of work. And the second was he had a client with a couple disgruntled employees. This was a manufacturing plant and someone anonymously defecated on the floor of the shop. Well, the employer thought it would be a good idea to bring in the disgruntled employees and collect a saliva sample from both of their their cheeks orally to send off to a genetic testing facility along with the sample from the shop floor to confirm the match. Well, as it turns out, it was not a match, and the employer wound up with a big fat lawsuit and huge expense to rectify the situation, and goes to show that in one of the takeaways from today's episode, as you'll hear, is Andrew thinks that if you employ people, just don't be an idiot. Hire help if you need help and abide by the letter of the law, both locally at the state level and nationally. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. Drew, welcome to the show. Thanks for thanks for being on with me. Thanks for having me. So you you I, I'm really excited to have you on as a guest because we are talking we're we're going to be discussing a topic today that we haven't really covered yet on the podcast, but a lot of our listeners are probably yeah, interested in, to say the least, maybe even concerned about. And that's HR type issues, labor law, employment issues. You're an expert in this stuff. Could we start? Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional career and the firm where you work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and rightfully so, I should say most people probably don't consider this stuff because it is not fun. Uh, it's not the entertaining part of running a business. Um but uh, I work for a HR management consulting firm, uh, Clements Nelson and Associates. So for small businesses out there, we're a small business and we're coming up pretty close on our 50th anniversary. So we've been doing it for quite a long time. Um, we are comprised of lawyers and non-lawyers alike. We've got people that come from all walks of life with like MBAs, masters of uh, public administration as well, former safety service directors and CEOs and things like that to form this unique perspective of legal compliance and business smarts, let's say, uh, to give hopefully a 360 answer to our clients where it's not just what's legal, right? It's like, well, what's the best business decision? Uh, Because a lot of times when you're just talking to a lawyer, it's just simply here it is, here's the law, but there's no afterthought with the repercussions of it or can you go above and beyond and what will the payout be? So that's, we've been advising clients on this type of stuff for, for a long time. Right on. Well, I've got, I've got a softball question for you first. It may even make you chuckle. My attorney here. So I am in California. You're in Ohio. Is that right? Ohio. I got family in California. You got to get whereabouts. Uh, The San Diego area. Ah, okay. 
big state, a couple hours away, but also also nice down there. I'm in I'm in Sacramento, of course. Yeah. So my my attorney here keeps telling me that every year I need to purchase another one of these labor law posters for like twenty five bucks and post it up in uh, a readily visible area in the office for everybody to see. And it has things about in, like information about whistleblowers and minimum wage and all this stuff. And to me, it's a nuisance and almost a little bit of a scam for these companies that just sell this to me every single year. Um, do I really need to update that every single year? You do. Uh, it is good advice. Um, cause it's the little things, right? It's, it's the little things that matter to small businesses. Um, and getting sued for, uh, you know, the state's going to be different in California. There could be state posting requirements. It could be a thousand dollar statutory violation, but it could say plus attorney's fees. And then those attorney's fees could be like 7,000. And then that could really affect your month on any given day. Um, but a lot of these posting requirements stem from the Family Medical Leave Act, um, which requires a various amount of postings in a conspicuous place at all of your locations. So if you have more than one office, it's not sufficient that you put up the headquarters, right? So if you have, you know, a branch office, there has to be a poster there. And every state's going to have these unique things. I will say it is a scam, right? It's not a scam because of the law, but these ideas that you have to pay $25 for these laminated posters every year is pretty ridiculous. Um, if I snapped my camera off and walked down the hall to our kitchen, you'd see our posters, um, but you'd see kind of like a thick, uh, a thick binder clip where we just print off the poster, the flyer off our state's website, and we just add it to the front, right? So we just print it out simply and pay the cost of an eight by 11 sheet. And then that's how we update it. Um, but you, if you don't know what you're printing, it's best to go through a company that's kind of guaranteeing that you have all of the right posters. That's not a bad idea. I like that. Maybe I'll walk down the hall and snap a picture of some other office that has the updated one and then pay 15 instead of $25 yeah, to or, blow uh, it up. <laughs> you know, power of numbers, right? Let's let's all get the one poster together and just make a copy, right? Because it's there, there's no way it's trademarked or, or copyrighted, I should say. You know, it's a federal regulation or a state regulation poster. It's, so it's yeah. not proprietary. So That's right. I'll, I'll right. get together, pay pay fifteen cents, and all the financial and wealth management uh, firms in Sacramento can all share posters. <laughs> it sounds nice to save a few bucks out of spite, but my business coach is in my ear telling me that I need to be more respectful of my own time, and <laughs> maybe that's a non-starter from the time and energy intense. The, <laughs> don't be penny wise, pound foolish, or step over a dime, step over a dollar to pick up a dime, something like that. Exactly. Exactly. So, so tell me what kind of businesses you typically work with in your practice. Uh, we we represent. It's not a not really an any specific type. Um, I will say we don't do a lot of manufacturing or anything like that. But it's not because we wouldn't. We just don't. So we do all public cent- sector entities, uh, any type. So you have cities, counties, housing authorities. Those are doing your public sector housing, libraries cemetery districts, you know, states across the nation have different forms of government. So you can call it whatever you want. Um, we do nonprofits as well, um, which are very akin to public sector, even though they're private sector. Uh, and then we do anything from snowblow companies to restaurant groups, uh, to private hospitals, you know, it, it we have a couple law firms that we represent, uh, some small CPA firms, things like that. So anybody who has an employee will represent. Gotcha. Okay. So I've got some, some other easy, maybe on the spectrum, easier stuff for us that I'd like to cover first, then maybe we can get into some of the more complex topics that are going to require maybe a little more of your brain space later on. But to get us started, a lot of people that we have worked with here at the firm over the years, um, they're, they're smaller businesses, typically between you know, two and like 25 employees. Mm -hmm. And for those smaller growing enterprises, a lot of people uh, are interested in hiring 1099 contractors instead of W-2 employees. Can can you describe the lens, the the legal landscape for that? When is somebody a 1099 contractor? When are they a W-2 employee? 
what do you need to be aware of if you're trying to uh, save a few bucks by not putting someone on payroll? I think that's an incredibly important distinction for all small employers to understand fully before they go this route. Um, And unfortunately, with every election, the answer may slightly change, right? Because whoever the president is at any given time is going to institute his new cabinet member who will be the head of the Department of Labor that will then hire his general counsel that will issue guidance and possibly withdraw guidance in administrative rules. So you actually just saw this when uh, Biden took office from Trump. There was specific guidance that the Trump administration had put in about independent contractors that Biden's office withdrew, and they're actually putting forth uh, their advisory rule, which is now in the comment period. So it's a flux area. I will say it's very safe when you're talking about trying to evaluate it. It's all about control. That is the key to whether someone's an independent contractor. How much control does the employer exert over that individual? And there used to be a multi-part test that the IRS had. You know, I think it was like 20 parts. Mm -hmm. Then it got narrowed down into three parts, behavioral control, financial control, and managerial control. But then those three parts had subparts, right? So they, all the 20 parts were still encompassed. So when you talk about financial control, what you're talking about is, does the independent contractor only work for you? Right. So like, uh, so Grant, in your, in your world, if you had a independent contractor as an analyst, right. And who was providing you with research and data and things like that for different investment vehicles and you were paying him, you know, and he was putting in 40 hours a week for you. And he was the only source of income was, you know, was your financial uh, wealth management firm. He has great financial resources allocated from you. And that's his only source of income. So that would be a, call it a, a, a bullet against you, right? One strike, right? Then it's going to be, well, how do you pay him? Are you paying him through your payroll software? Are you paying him through check? Is he invoicing you, right? So that has to do with financial control. Do they just send you, hey, I here's a bill for my work. Here's the construction job I did. You know, here's a new kitchen, yada, yada, yada. Then it'd be things like, Do you tell him to come into work at eight? Do you tell him to leave at five? Does he use your computers, your internet, things like that? And it's all a balancing test. So that's why there's not going to be a significant right answer or wrong. But where small employers get in trouble is they go on the wonderful Google machine. They type in independent contractor agreement, print it out or rocket lawyer or one of these things like that. And they think it's good. And the test in California Right. There's going to be state test and then there's going to be a federal test. Right. California leads the way on a lot of these gig economy things like Uber is the big case in California and Lyft is a new one. Mm -hmm. You could have different standards. So not only do you need to look at state and federal, um, you need to look at your jurisdiction and Google doesn't care about your jurisdiction. Right. And just because you call it a duck, an independent contractor. Right. Doesn't mean it's going to be. And when you do that wrong, the penalties are enormous. So. I am not telling employers to shy away from it. In fact, small employers, I think, should utilize independent contractors as a way to reduce costs. You don't have uh, employment uh, employment law taxes that go with it, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, workers' comp. Uh, if you offer insurance, you don't have health insurance and things like that or 401k matching. So you, you reduce that, we'll call it 30% roll-up to your underlying costs. And you mm-hmm. may actually be able to pay more. If you're not paying that overhead, you may be able right. to hire, have a higher hourly rate. <clears throat> but right. So what is your what is your legal risk there? If if you if you are uh, in the gray area, you have somebody signed up as an independent contractor that, in spirit, really should be mm-hmm. a W two employee. Where can you get in trouble and how? Well, the Department of Labor will be your first, you know, your first stop. They will evaluate whether you have actually classified the employee. The wrong way, and that's and if because you did, they audit random businesses periodically around the uh, country. It wouldn't be so much an audit; it'd be a complaint, right? It would mm. be the employee or independent contractor gets mm. a plaintiff's attorney, submits a complaint through the Department of Labor portal um, or in state or federal court, alleging that you've been classified wrong. 
And if that's the case, well, you haven't been playing your taxes, right? So the IRS man is going to come and you don't want to be on the wrong end of, of the government in any case, whether it's the IRS, Department of Labor, uh, like OSHA, you know, mm -hmm. any governmental agency that can govern employment, you do not want to be on their end. You can deal with plaintiff's cases from an employee perspective. The government's a whole different ballgame. Unlimited resources. <laughs> they don't care how many hours they put in. All their attorneys are salaried. So they're not paying an hourly rate to uh, an attorney in, in California that may be costing you $500 an hour to defend. So right. you've got the tax, man. Then you've got any benefits that were potentially withheld, right? So if they were eligible for these contributions and things like that, then you may be entitled to those to that to that monetary value, right? This is how much money I should have had. This and that. This is how much leave I should have had. Um, all sorts of things. Did I incur any healthcare costs while I was out because I wasn't offered health insurance, right? Are they are they considered an employee for the purposes of your employee count for the purposes of FMLA and these other laws, like? So it could open up kind of a Pandora's box of different things that you've done wrong. So right. it adds up quick. Um, and then it kind of gets exacerbated, exacerbated over time. Right. Uh, there's a certain amount of look back periods for different things. But when you start building up the time, that's where the real money comes into play. OK. OK. Interesting. So tell us a little, a little bit about the difference between an hourly and a salaried employee then. Let's say that you're going the W-2 route, you're on the straight and narrow. Um, and the best way that it's been described to me is, uh, you know, difference between 1099 and W-2 is you pay them, a, you incur some additional costs by bringing them onto your payroll. You have to have a payroll system for it and all that. But for that additional cost, you get to tell them what to do. You get to tell them when to work, how to work, how to do it. The spirit of an independent contractor, as you point out, is they have to be able to do it when they want. They have to be able to do it for multiple um, employers, basically. If they're W-2, you can tell them when and where and how uh, for an additional cost. But then you've got the difference between salaried and hourly. So tell us about the landscape there. So, and I think for field by field, it's going to be very specific on whether your employees can likely be salaried or hourly. Right. In your classic white collar fields, um, I, I think the vast majority of the employees in those fields were going to fall and pass a salary basis test just to let everybody know. So if you are a, a CPA, if you are a, a doctor, a lawyer, um, a CFA, you know, if you're one of the one of these type of if you have acronyms after your name and are running one of these uh, shops, your employees are likely the same as you as well, offering those kind of professional services. So to have salary versus salary, first of all, you can't just decide who you're going to pay salary and hourly, right? In order to pay someone's salary, they have to pass a test, right? And the Department of Labor seems to be the theme right now for today. Uh, they established a test for whether you are, can be eligible for salary basis, or I should say for overtime. Uh, it's called ex being exempt from overtime. And to do that, you could either fall under the professional, uh, the executive, um, or the managerial exemption. There's three main ones. And this is one thing where, well, I made fun of Google before. If anybody at home types into the internet and they type in like Department of Labor fact sheet, um, exempt, non-exempt employees, you're going to get a nice little one-page PDF put out by the Department of Labor. It doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it tells you the three main exemptions each one of these has four parts to it. The very first part is you have to pay them a salaried basis. Um, you heard me talking about Department of Labor rules that get issued by incoming presidential nominees, right? If everybody remembers prior to Donald Trump, there was a rule that was in place that was going to increase the salary threshold from, I believe it was $455 a week to $933 a week, right? There's a big, and it got put on hold from the appellate court in Texas after uh, Trump took office. But I believe the current salary threshold is somewhere in the $600, $650 range mm -hmm. is where it sits. So you have to pay them that salary basis. That means if they uh, miss two hours, you know, or whatever, you're not docking their salary, right? It doesn't mean all that they're getting paid for doing the job, 
not the mm-hmm. amount of work. As long as the deliverables are being done, that's what you're paying for. Now, if they're absence for a full day or more, you can deduct, right? Full day absences you're allowed and you won't defeat it. And then there's other parts of the test. So if you're uh, if you're a manager or something, you supervise two or more full time employees, right? Uh, and and do you have independent discretion on matters of significance to the employer, right? Are you hiring and firing people or even recommending to hiring and firing people? Are you participating in uh, budget discussions? Are you making large purchases? Are you investing client funds? Things like that. And there's highly compensated employees as well, which is a different test. But each one of these has these four prongs. You have to meet every single prong. It is not a balancing test. You have to meet every single prong to be salaried exempt. If you do not, and the employer pays you salary, what they're doing is most likely violating the FLSA because they're not paying them overtime. The, the benefit of this is you can work them 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, and they get paid the same amount. Right, right. Now, everyone else is what you were talking about, which is overtime eligible. They work eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, doesn't really matter. But employers are required to pay overtime, which is time and a half for everything over 40 hours in a seven day work period. That is the floor, just to let you guys know. There's some that's actual time work. So if you have an unpaid lunch, that doesn't count towards their eight hours. Right. So they may work eight to five within one hour night, one hour unpaid lunch. But if they work, if you sit, if you eat your, uh, if you eat your lunch at your desk, and you're an hourly employee, and let's say you're a good employee, and the phone is ringing, and you're like, well, I'm not just going to stare at my phone. I'm going to pick it up and answer it because I'm a, a normal human. That's compensable time because you're actually working. So this right. is where employers get in a lot of trouble. We. I like to say that the FLSA is a really terrible piece of legislation because it really like penalizes good employees, right? Benefits bad employees. And there's no in between, right? It's the, the bad employees who are always lo- looking to litigate are always like, like two years later, they're like, by the, and by the way, I, I have a notepad and tracked all my hours and my lunch for the past two years. And next thing you know, you're getting sued. And your good employees, you're like constantly telling stop working through your lunch. Like you're putting me at risk and they just won't stop because right. it's okay. They're not going to make a claim for $20 on their next paycheck. So <clears throat> don't get this wrong because it adds up. And it's a, it's a two year look back period for this. If you, if you get hit by the department of labor plus attorney's fees. Interesting. Okay. So the, in, in a nutshell, your biggest your, your, your biggest legal risk is really from uh, a complaint from one of your employees going into the DOL. They're sitting there eating their, their lunch. It's supposed to be an unpaid thing, but the phone's ringing. They answer the phone. That's that's a source of risk. Yeah. And it's really easy for small employers to get kind of uh, blinded is probably a good way to look to go. That, that'll that never happen to me. Um Because what happens is if you have a good supervisor or a good boss or this and that, or you're a good boss, right, then the complaints don't happen. But then if you, uh, you know, you bring in a partner, right, and the partner doesn't jive with your support staff, Mm -hmm. or you bring in another employee and that employee, let's make it ridiculous, like that employee starts sexually harassing. Once the workplace turns to not being pleasant Mm -hmm. and I don't like to be there that's when all of a sudden they start remembering all the times they should have been paid. Right. 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 And it, 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 cause and it's got this long look back period. <clears throat> it's not like they have to bring the claim within one month of the alleged misclassification or the alleged uh, shortage of their pay. Right? right. They, they can bring it, you know, they can bring it within a long period of time and then you have to figure out how am I going to go back two years? And did you keep payroll records for them for two years? Probably not. Um, unless you have like a, an ADP or a pay core, one of these systems in place. Yeah. So the employee who's suing you probably has handwritten notes going back all two years. And the court presumes that that's accurate. Right. They, they presume that right. it's accurate. So you need to be really careful about it. So what, what about what about the reverse? Let's say that you, you're, you're offering paid breaks, paid lunches and so forth. <clears throat> 
So if do you have, do you have any risk for that situation? Uh, you've got zero risk, right? So this is the huge, um, if you can afford it, I know not everyone can, right? I yeah. know payroll is an enormous cost. Um, but if you can afford to just say, I'm going to have a paid lunch, then when they work, you have no risk because you're paying for it already. So yeah. when the call comes in, yeah, answer your phone. But when you hear stories from various types of businesses where they have like a lunch room and say no eating at the desk or you actually can't even eat on site. The reason that employers have those rules in place is because of Department of Labor lawsuits. And I shouldn't say Department of Labor lawsuits. It's it's employee lawsuits getting enforced by the Department of Labor where someone worked through their lunch. That that, that is the, the genesis of it. Right. Right. Interesting. So let's let's change the topic slightly. Then Th- there are certain thresholds in terms of employee count yep. that make you eligible um, for new like uh, requirements. For example, you don't have to offer any health benefits until you get to X number of employees, which is fifty, right? Correct. And so, it, it, so it's fifty. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So. This goes, I mean, all the way back to, you know, to Obama, I guess, with the seminal piece of legislation with the ACA, um, Mm -hmm. where it talked about when you become a large employer. And once you become a large employer, you're required to offer health insurance. Um, And there's also these things, there's measuring periods. Um, So most employers choose a 12-month measuring period. So You basically take a snapshot of your workforce, go back 12 months, say, did I employ 50 or more people in that 12 months? If the answer is yes, then you have to offer health insurance going forward for like the next year. You offer for the next year, then you can kind of do another snapshot, look back. So you're doing like a measuring period almost every other year to make Mm -hmm. sure you're always in compliance. And by the time you're this big, most of the payroll softwares that I've seen have like ACA compliance components that are kind of like tracking um, your ongoing staffing if mm-hmm. in case you ever drop. But this is a good one to time with the independent contractor. I'm like, look, if you're at 40 people and can figure out how to use independent contractors to stay at 40, stay at 40. Now, if you're going to, you know, expand, you know, by three offices then don't play games with, can I figure out how to get 60 independent contractors? Like you're going to blow by 50 so much, but I have clients that like sit at like 52 and I'm just like, isn't there some way that you can figure out how to be 49 because it is so cost uh, prohibitive to be right at that threshold. Um, And there's other thresholds that people aren't aware of besides, uh, The health insurance. So like that 50 employee threshold for health insurance also applies to the Family Medical Leave Act. Just to let you know, uh, for people that are getting uh, what's most commonly seen in the public eye for like maternity and paternity leave, right? Now, family medical leave is used for all sorts of things. Cancer, you have an ACL surgery and need six weeks to recover, right? It's any or your spouse does and they need help from you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you do all these things and the FMLA applies, but the FMLA is that's the leave provision, right? So there's other portions of the Family Medical Leave Act that are not driven by employee count. So the common example I give is, uh, if you have a staff of eight, let's say, maybe a staff of 10, t- good chance that one of your employees is going to be female. Let's say uh, she has a child, right? You have a low employee count, so you're not required to give leave for the bonding care. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't, by the way. That's not what I'm advocating, and we can talk about that uh, later. But when she does that, there's there's the good old expression of breast milk. So breastfeeding for the lay men out there that don't have kids or don't have a wife or anything like that that haven't gone through this. But you have to provide a non-bathroom private area with reasonable time off to do the expression of breast milk. It doesn't matter if you've got four employees or 150 employees. That That law applies, right? So... There's different things like that, and that's also the poster. you got to put your posters up, and you have your policies in place. Um, but the leave provision, you have to have over 50 employees. So that's, that's a very important threshold in the workplace. 
Okay. Um, there's, and there's other thresholds for liability and things like that that are very state specific. Right. Um, and I, I, in Ohio, for example, if you have four or more employees, different discrimination laws kick into play. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So is it fair to say that nationally, the 50 employee threshold is the only one that you need to worry about? N- nationally, the 50 employee threshold for FMLA mm-hmm. and the ACA. And mm-hmm. then there's also 50, a 15 employee uh, threshold. Um, should double check it for the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's going to be 15. It could maybe 25. I'm thinking off the top of my head. Um, mm. But the ADA has a different threshold than that. So any federal law with their thresholds, right, whether it's 15, 20, or 50 for these various discrimination leave laws, those apply nationally, right? So, but the issue is your state, California, they may say any employee, you can, maybe one employee and discrimination laws of the state apply. Right. Because I'll say <clears throat> it's very safe to say that Every single state in the United States has a statute that essentially mimics, I'll call it Title VII of the 1964 Act, which is the discrimination statute covering religion, race, ethnicity, gen- uh, gender, all the all that fun stuff that's on the hot topics of people's minds right now. Right. Okay. Okay. So very state specific. And, and in California, off the top of my head, I think... I think what my attorney told me is once when we get to five employees, we need to do some new stuff, add an employee yeah. handbook and incorporate some new wrinkles to the whole game. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, I would say and like, by the way, FLSA that we're starting before before as a national one, it's one employee, right? There's no like magic yeah. number where if I only have one employee, I can pay somebody two dollars an hour. You know, yeah. that that's not how it works. It applies just across the board. Right, 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 right. So it, w- w- what I'm hearing from you, Drew, is <clears throat> in one of my observations in working with a lot of business owners, payroll is most people's, most businesses' largest expense. This is a source of legal risk, so you need to be on top of it. When you work with people in your practice and in your day-to-day career in your life, what are some of the biggest sources of risk that you run into? What are people missing? What holes come up over and over and over again? So I, I think the biggest holes that people have, and you already mentioned it actually, is you, you know you mentioned this five employee threshold, are employee handbooks or policy manuals, interchangeable vernacular, position descriptions, right? I think those two items for any small employer will really save you a lot of headache because when you start going through the process of developing an employee handbook, you're going to learn about these laws, right? And it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know. And when you have the manual, all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, crap, what am I getting into? And that's a good thing to say to yourself. Like, it's not good as a business owner to go around and not be thinking, what could, what landmine could I possibly be stepping on, right? If that's how you're operating, like you are going to blow up. Uh, There's, there's too much going on. Um, with the advent of, you know, the internet, we'll say it loosely, people have so much information at their fingertips. Uh, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that governs discrimination. I mean, it's basically an app where they will evaluate whether you have a claim to sue your employer. It's like, enter these, enter some facts. Yes, click this button. And it like guides you through, here's how you do it, right? Like, so it is... It is not hard. There's not, and the U.S. system is like that. There's not a barrier of entry to the U.S. legal system like in many other countries, where if you take a gamble uh, and lose, you have to pay Walmart's attorney's fees, right? That doesn't happen in in the U.S. There isn't these fee shifting statutes, or, or very rarely, and that's where you get people that uh, you know get mad at attorneys for taking frivolous claims. They get mad at, at individuals for bringing bogus claims. Um, but what I mean, what did we see here today? Now it's unemployment related, but we saw, you know, the Sandy Hook trial in California just get a billion dollars awarded against Alex Jones uh, for that. So these damages are real. Um, we had a case here in Ohio where it was a, a sexual harassment uh, case that was going on, and they ended up 
instituting his three point, I want to say seven, five million dollar judgment against the uh, employer as a whole. And then a hundred thousand dollars of personal liability to the manager. Right. And that's like, so there's in Ohio, the law just changed recently, but you could have actually individual liability for not doing your due diligence. So you think you're protected properly because you have an LLC or you have a, a, a partnership agreement. And then all of a sudden you get a judgment that attaches personal liability to you, right? Like these are real issues. And when you have the manual that says, here's how we handle complaints, here's our rules about reporting issues, you're giving yourself a de facto defense, right? Because you go, did you follow our reporting procedure? Who did you tell? Well, if you didn't tell anybody, how am I supposed to know, right? A common one for FLSA, if you're paid incorrectly, you need to report it to us. It's called giving yourself a safe harbor. And then if you report, if you fail to do it, well, I can't fix it. So that gives it, if you're working off the clock, you have to turn that time in before the next pay period. If they don't turn it in, they can't come two years later and then say, no, I do have it, right? It gives right. you another safe harbor provision. And then on the other side is your job description. That helps you if you if you ever have to do a termination and are fighting unemployment. It's like, here are the job duties. Here are the requirements. And you just properly document everything. So when you have those two documents, it lets employers, if they're doing things right, create a nice paper trail to have exhibits A through Z. And you're really helping out your counsel um, to try to mitigate and dissuade any plaintiff's attorneys from taking the case because yeah. you didn't just make a knee-jerk reaction. It's like you built this wonderful case. You have rules. You have everything in place. You're like, look, what do you want me to do? Right? A real complicated legal argument. What do you want me to do, <laughs> plaintiff's attorney? <laughs> when you right. lay out a really good case, you can tell when the other <clears throat> side gets um, disheartened in their ability to get uh, a quick payday. <clears throat> right. You're, you're, one thing that stuck out at me is, is that that, make, that makes total sense. And and one thing that stuck out is that when, when when you're growing and taking on more staff, as the organization grows and becomes a little bit more complex, you truly just don't know what you don't know. And one thing that I found that is ubiquitous across all industries is that there, as you're growing, there are these certain uh, thresholds or or plateaus. And this is this is true and financial advisory. It's, it's, I know for a fact, it's true in law firms and, and all other industries. But once you get to that plateau, it takes a renewed investment in infrastructure and, or people or technology or mar marketing or, or something to get over that plateau to the next, to the next peak. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, it takes an investment of something, either time or energy or money to blow through. Once you blow through it, you have a little bit more operating leverage and momentum until you get to that next peak. And this is an excellent example of that because there are a lot of businesses and a lot of owners of businesses out there who just deliberately decide, I don't want to go through that. I'm going to sit pretty before I have to you know, take on employee number five or employee number 50 and go through all this additional headache of totally blowing up my, my benefits or doing the handbook thing or wh whatever it is. This is a great example of, of that. And, you know, for owners out there, yeah, I think it's wise to make a decision of whether growth is congruent with your personal objectives or whether it's just growth for growth's sake, because that's going to create more headaches than it, than it solves problems down the road. Yeah. I, I, I think that's such a, a great point, right? Growth for growth's sake, or is it with your personal objective? Because there's no way to to church it up, right? When you yeah. start adding bodies to your agency, uh, you know, to your organization, it is going to get inherently more complicated just because of the human dynamic, not even because of the law, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the interplay of of people and you mm -hmm. go, it's almost, I think of it, of, if you have any people that operate like a rental portfolio and they have like five properties and they're all cash flowing positive and they have all been phenomenal and uh, they've owned them for 10 years and it's like, but they, and they've been looking for a sixth for 10 years. They're so discerning because they don't want to blow up their portfolio because everything has been fantastic. It's like, if you have a great team of four and you want to bring in that fifth, 
but the fifth happens to not get along and it ruins everything that's going on. It's like, well, what's the risk you want to take? Right. Exactly. So it's a, it's a tough choice for employers. Um, I would say from like the compliance and legal aspect, I think people shouldn't be as concerned there. If you build a good foundation for your house, it will be stable. The dynamics, the interpersonal dynamics, there's no guarantees there. That is a, a, a tough one. And you just got to make your best hiring decision. You can, you know, and hope they, uh, hope they vibe with everybody. Right. Right. So another question I wanted to ask you is <clears throat> looking, looking ahead now we're, we're in, you know, kind of a politically charged environment and, you know, with, without, you know, taking a side on either end of the aisle, we're just in a new workplace dynamic. There are a lot more uh, companies hiring people full-time remote. Uh, there are a lot more, you know, <clears throat> new things that employers have to deal with. What do you, could you share a little bit about how you see this landscape? Everybody, you know, a lot of people have uh, preferred pronouns now. How does that, you have something you mentioned when we talked on the phone yesterday was, you know, some people might prefer a unisex bathroom in the future. How do you navigate all this stuff? Yeah, this is the 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 new future, right? Or the you know the new normal. It's like a cliche. I I hate saying, especially after three years and and counting of COVID, right? Like the new normal was said too many times in my conversations with clients. Um, <laughs> but it is it, it is this um, ambiguous, never ending moving goalpost of what to do. And then there's always a new thing in the way, whether it, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's the cares act and whether then it's PPP stuff. And then, uh, then it's, you know, a political fallout, uh, between two parties that looked irrevocable, that, that still looks, you know, like wider than the grand Canyon. Now you've got inflation through the roof. Like there's no break for employers. Right. So, what I'm seeing is if you're talking about attracting and retaining talent uh, in attracting kind of your Gen Z and millennials is trying to figure out work-life balance. You talked about that permanent remote. Um, I don't think that that's going to stay, just to be honest. I think you're going to see the hybrid, like, you know, two days in, three days off, or just a lot of flexibility um, involving that. I know we, we've we always had that here. Um but everywhere I go, the number one thing on people's mind is flexibility. Um, a short second or third isn't even pay, right? It's actually things that you talk about, like gender pronouns and all these complicated things. It's a, it's diversity and it's the willingness to be a little bit open minded. It's it's not a political stance, but that is what the people out there looking for jobs are looking for um, in the fields that we represent. They they don't want. Um, kind of this closed minded. And then my employers go, what do I do? Um, I'll use us as an example. I mean, we're looking at new office space right now, and we're trying to come up with more attractive office space to make our current employees happier, attract new employees, put walkable amenities around, right? Like nicer things, things that we never would have done before. Um, and then I've got clients that are doing new builds um, and they're with their architects going gender neutral bathrooms, right? They're doing single stalls. Um, some of them are just doing the normal male, female, but then they have to adopt a policy that says you get to use the bathroom that you uh, align with. You know, I, the terminology is not, not correct there, but however you identify with you, you, you can use that bathroom. And that's inevitably going to end up with a complaint. I'm just going to say it. It is going to happen with a complaint. Um, you're going to have someone who's transitioning uh, one one way or the other. You're going to have somebody who that doesn't make them feel comfortable, that doesn't make that person a bad person, by the way. Uh, like no one is comfortable in the bathroom with another person. I have yet to meet that person. So then having <laughs> someone, right? Right. So then having someone who you perceive to be the opposite sex, like it's a, a vulnerable and embarrassing thing anyway. So the dynamics there are tough. So I think if employers have single use restrooms, it's just really easy to take that sign down and make it unisex. Like that's a no brainer. Now, if you are 30, 40, 50, 60 employees, 
that may be challenging because you actually need a bank of stalls to accommodate the amount of people going to the bathroom at any given time, right? If you're less than 10, you don't need that. You, you can get away probably with two single stall restrooms. Um, there's also some unintended con- consequences that can be good things. I have several clients that move to unisex and the women actually love it because more often than not, it's not, they would be waiting in a line, but they would all say, if they go to the restroom, like it'd be like a 30% chance that it would be locked, that someone would be in it because there were like six females and two males. So now like they always get to use the restroom. There's always one open. Right. You know, it's like unintended benefit. Right. Interesting. So I just, just don't foreclose on these things. I think if employers get worried about it, but the reality is the Supreme Court said that this is a protected class. And I think if you don't go unisex, we're talking about liability. That's an area that there's going to be increased liability if you fail to accommodate um, or provide equal access to these restrooms based on these protected classes. Right, right. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the takeaway that I'm I'm getting from you here, Drew, is that the most important thing is just being open-minded to the needs and concerns of your staff. That and and don't don't be an idiot <laughs> and close off, you know, um, uh, not just complaints but ideas and thoughts. And I mean, you're, yeah. you're you're working together as a unit, and any successful organization is going to have good morale and, and 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 some culture there. And uh, that's a good way to ruin it if is if you close off. Um, the organization to, to, to new thoughts and ideas like that. Well, I love that. You just, just don't be an idiot. When I, when I, t- I give presentations uh, all around the, the nation on some of this stuff, almost in no matter what my topic is, one of my slides is actually a quote from the office from Dwight Schrute. And he just says, basically when he's trying to determine a decision he should make, he says, I think to myself, would an idiot do it? And if they would, then I don't do it. Right. Like, and I was like, that's <laughs> such a perfect, simple way to say it. <laughs> and I was like, of course, Dwight Schrute. Um, and, and another thing that kind of piqued my interest when you said understanding your employees, have, have you or have any of your clients, have you ever heard the term stay interview? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. It ring, rings a bell in the sense of just having ordinary one-on-ones with your staff and just an interview. Hey, how are things going uh, as an opportunity to just debrief, right? Yeah. So these are, these are things they're, they're, they're really popular now. Um, I've been advocating for them for almost 10 years and people would laugh. So everyone's heard of an exit interview, mm-hmm. right? You know, and I, I go, I, despise exit interviews. I think they're maybe the biggest waste of an employer's time and the outgoing employee, right? Uh, Truly. I mean, think about, I I do a medical comparison. When's the last time an autopsy brought the person back to life, right? Like that's an exit interview. The person is gone. So if they're leaving on good terms, they're not really going to tell you the truth, right? Like they want to leave on good terms. They want to protect their safety net. They maybe they even want to build up your ego. Hey, nothing you did. It's great. I just got an opportunity. I couldn't refuse. Right now, if they're leaving on bad terms, maybe they missed work for a week straight. Maybe they um, mismanaged, you know, $2 million of your biggest client's account, you know, and are insider traded or did something else, did malpractice, who knows. And then they leave and they just burn it out bridge. You're the worst boss. This place stinks. Everybody hates you. Like, <laughs> do you take that for what it's worth? No. Like, what can you actually gain truthfully from an exit interview? So I've never seen the value. The stay interview, completely and separate apart from like performance evaluations, five, seven questions, like what makes you want to come to work here? What can what would make this place better? Um, you know, and inevitably you're gonna get pay. Pay is always yeah. gonna come up, but you're gonna get crazy things that surprise you. Um I had a client did a stay interview. One of the things they put in there was a, a woman said, I wish I could like personalize my office more, like actually paint the office, not mm. just put up posters and things and, you know, accolades. Mm-hmm. We said, great. Absolutely. She comes in on a weekend, paints her office, some color, whatever. 
Three other people saw it. We're like, I didn't know we could do that. Then they came to their supervisor and we're like, hey, can we do that too? And supervisor was like, sure. Those three people came in on a weekend. Then the supervisor came in and surprised them, brought pizza. And it reminded me of like your first apartment, right? That's Where cool. you have your buddies over, say, come help me paint. I'll get the case of beer. We'll put on the game and pizza and I get some labor. And you had four people painting together that probably didn't have that out of work experience. And if all of a sudden your work colleagues become friends, it's really, really hard to leave. Yeah. Really hard to leave, you know, $5,000, $10,000 extra somewhere else for the unknown doesn't sound so tempting, but if it's impersonal and we don't really care about our coworkers, yeah, sure. Why wouldn't I go somewhere else if they're going to give me 5,000 more bucks? Right, right. So <clears throat> the interviews are, are a nice, nice little tidbit for new, for your clients that are trying to grow or keep people, more importantly, how yeah. to keep good talent. Right, right. Well, that's, that's a great place to leave it, Drew. This has been really interesting to me. We covered ground that we haven't on the show today, and I think our listeners are going to get a lot from um, what, what stuff can we direct people to? Do you uh, mention the name of your firm again? Do you have a show or a blog or, or anything that, uh, people can follow? Yeah. Uh, well, our, our firm is Clements Nelson and associates. So clementsnelson.com and we got Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff. Um, and I do a, a appropriately named start of the podcast over the pandemic who didn't, uh, <laughs> called the reliably intermittent podcast, but we have been on a hiatus for several, several months because we got so busy, but we will be starting it back up hopefully in 2023. So true to the, true to the name, it. right? <laughs> yep, exactly. In the, in the spirit of FMLA, that's what we called it reliably intermittent for intermittent FMLA leave. Nice. Um, but there's about 20, 25 episodes up uh, on all the different platforms and YouTube videos. If you want to see it talking about when the vaccine stuff was going on, the vaccine mandates and what was happening oh, yeah. with the election and stuff like that and what mm -hmm. employers should do and risks um, and this type of stuff, uh, H HR tips of the day, things like that. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thanks again for the time. This is this has been a, a really cool conversation and I, I appreciate your your wisdom on the subject. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.